Canada's most famous gang of robbers set their sights south of the border. Nine seconds! They take millions from U.S. banks and lead police on a chase that lasts 10 long years. On the night of November 15, 1979, a guard at Canada's Joyceville Penitentiary in Ontario made a startling discovery. Patrick Mitchell, a convicted thief, had collapsed. He was sweating profusely and short of breath. The prison nurse recognized that Mitchell was in trouble. This was no inmate scam to get out of a work detail. The man's pulse was racing, and he was barely coherent. It looked like a heart attack. But Mitchell would never make it to the emergency room. At the hospital, the ambulance was greeted not by doctors, but by gunmen. Don't move! Don't move! Get the stretcher out of the way! Hey, let's get over there. He's not doing well. Within seconds, they vanished into the darkness. Five minutes. Five minutes. Mitchell's five escape minutes. plan worked flawlessly. Thanks to the help of his longtime friends and accomplices, Stephen Reed and Lionel Wright. Earlier that evening, Mitchell dissolved a pack of cigarettes in water and drank the toxic brew. He knew the massive dose of nicotine would shock his system and mimic the symptoms of a heart attack. Reed and Wright had been eager to free the leader of their gang. Now they feared he might not survive the stunt. Patty Mitchell and his accomplices were Canada's most notorious bank robbers. The trio had been convicted of stealing $165,000 worth of gold bullion from the Ottawa International Airport. It was one of the biggest heists in Canadian history. Now Mitchell would also be known as the mastermind behind one of the most daring prison breaks ever attempted. We're gonna be on the An escape that wouldn't have been possible without the help of his friends. No. The three men had been stealing for years. They joined forces in the early 1970s. Patty, what do you think? Stephen Reed was a high school dropout and petty criminal. Lionel Wright worked as a bookkeeper by day and a thief by night. The men were relieved when Mitchell did in fact recover. Once he was feeling up to it, they wasted no time planning their next move. They knew it was too risky to stay in Ottawa. The three men headed to San Diego, California. For Patty, San Diego was like a dream come true. The weather was perfect and the banks were plentiful. Patty and his boys liked to live life in the fast lane. They just needed a little cash to finance their fun. Patty thought that he died and gone to heaven when he went to the United States and saw the land of riches. So many banks, as he says, such nice money. Mitchell was determined to get his hands on some of that nice money. Over the next several weeks, the men cased several banks. 
They were looking for a building with light security and back alleys for a quick getaway. A small credit union in San Diego seemed to fit the bill. The gang opened accounts so they could check out the bank's physical layout and personnel procedures. All the while, they took note of guard stations and peak business hours. Okay, well listen, sure, thank you very much. Okay, and uh, hope to see you. Okay, thank you very much. I want to come in this way. The men took great Around care here. in planning their crime. This alleyway park. Each man made his contribution. Lionel Wright's bookish ways were put to good use researching the bank's operations. Mitchell and Reed mapped out escape routes. They talked through every aspect of the heist. Once inside, they would each have a specific task. Wright would man the getaway car out front. Reed would watch the customers, and Mitchell would grab the cash. It all had to happen fast. Well, most bandits um, are not real sophisticated. Uh, we have thousands of robberies each year, and most of them are not really sophisticated uh, in the way they go about their business. However, these guys uh, were different. They were bold, meticulous, and above all, patient. The gang spent weeks refining their plan. Let's go, let's go. In February of 1980, they hit their first target, a large credit union in San Diego. Although the gang carried guns, Mitchell never intended to use them. If they moved fast enough, they would be long gone before the police even arrived. Just to be sure, they carried a stopwatch. 90 seconds! Throw me the bag! Right now! Go. The robbers go, left go, the bank go. after exactly 90 go, go, go. seconds. They took only the money they could grab in that amount of time. No longer, no exceptions. They were in the bank only a certain amount of time, and then, um, they weren't too greedy in that uh, when the end of that time came, they, uh, they were gone. Still pumped with adrenaline, the men counted the take from their first U.S. heist. The cash totaled over $20,000. In a mere 90 seconds, they had been able to steal nearly one quarter of their biggest job in Canada. I knew that was going to be. Oh, yeah, you knew. You didn't have it all. Life in America was looking better all the time. The gang was eager for more. They made plans to rob banks all over San Diego. Guard, guarding too. They began wearing outlandish Halloween masks to distract witnesses from noticing more pertinent details like height, weight, or hair color. And they always carried a stopwatch. In their first two months in San Diego, they hit four banks for a total of $70,000. The press named them the Stopwatch Gang. For Patty Mitchell, the U.S. was indeed the land of opportunity. By the end of the year, holdups in San Diego County had doubled. Police were baffled. Following another robbery, the FBI was called in to search for clues. Mitchell left them none. Witnesses could only recall the details of the robbers' weird masks. As the law struggled to find the mysterious stopwatch gang, its members enjoyed the good life. 
They treated themselves in France to designer clothes, flashy jewelry, trips to Vegas, and big nights on the town. With each passing month, the gang grew richer and more confident. The FBI simply grew more frustrated. By late summer 1980, Patty Mitchell's Canadian bandits were becoming too well known, or so he feared. He needed one last score, a heist so big he and his men could lay low in luxury for years. But he knew he would have to be patient. He was a consummate planner. He would case a joint if it took a month, two months, three months. He would follow the Brinks trucks around, the Wells Fargo trucks. He'd get their schedule down pat. He would know exactly to the second, to the minute, when they would be arriving at the bank. Mitchell noticed that armored trucks made cash pickups and deliveries to the Bank of America every Tuesday morning. The schedule never varied. The trucks arrived like clockwork at exactly 10.30 a.m. This was the shot he had been waiting for. There was just one problem. It's just the layout. The trucks were manned by two armed guards. If they jumped the guard on the street, his partner in the truck might start shooting. Mitchell preferred to catch the guard alone in the bank as he exited the vault. That meant the gang would have to wait for him inside. All right. We got the schedule. All right, what are we doing? For this heist, Halloween masks were out. What's the mirror for? Instead, Wright found library Anything books on how to apply yeah. wigs and theatrical okay. makeup. All right, come on. To look at yourself while you're putting on the makeup. Meanwhile, Mitchell and Reed scrutinized pickup times at dumpsters around the city. All right, listen. This isn't going to work. They would have to dump their disguises as quickly as possible after the heist. On September 23, 1980, Stephen Reed and Lionel Wright entered the Bank of America, wearing their new disguises. Patty Mitchell waited in the getaway car outside. Mitchell suspected the bank customers would be so busy going about their own business that they wouldn't even notice the strange beards his men were wearing. He was right. Suddenly, the stopwatch gang sprang into action. Wright and Reed quickly disarmed the guard and went to work. They were finished in 90 seconds. The gang escaped without being followed. According to plan, they gathered up the tools of their trade, a stolen license plate, bank bags, disguises, and stashed them in a dumpster. Then they left town, heading towards Arizona. Patty Mitchell had gotten his big score. It was the largest armed robbery in San Diego history. As usual, bank employees remembered little about the gunmen beyond their peculiar beards and wigs. The FBI had nothing to work with at first. In all his meticulous planning, there was one thing Patty Mitchell hadn't thought of. The regularly scheduled pickup at the dumpster was delayed. A man scavenging for bottles discovered three cloth bags with shipping tags from the Bank of America. A 
A search of the dumpster turned up the wigs, makeup, and clothing used in the robbery. FBI technicians matched fingerprints on the gear to two escaped Canadian convicts, Patrick Mitchell and Stephen Reed. Agents learned that Mitchell Reed and another Canadian, Lionel Wright, had worked together in the past. Take a look at what we got over here. They compared their mugshots with photos from bank security cameras. The suspects resembled the disguised gunmen. FBI agents felt sure they had finally identified the stopwatch gang. But they still had to find them. Listen, Authorities on. traced yeah. the gang's getaway car to a rental agency where they discovered the vehicle had been rented by one of the robbers. DMV records led them to Oak Creek, Arizona. The crew had taken up residence in a luxurious home in Oak Creek. Their wealth and generosity had already made them many friends in the community. They were enjoying themselves so much, they were unaware they were being watched. Okay, California. They were known as being big spenders, and uh, when they went out for dinner with folks, they always treated. Uh, they were passing out uh, $20 bills uh, on a regular basis, and certainly why not? It's not theirs. And um, so they were living the good life up there. In the early morning hours of October 31st, 1980, Stephen Reed was pulled over on what he thought was a routine traffic violation. For the sleepy town of Oak Creek, it was anything but routine. Officials raided the hideout, where they captured Wright. Stay down, Stay down. Stay down. But the leader of the stopwatch gang had escaped again. Do you understand those rights? We had to actually start from ground zero again and start contacting people, uh, sources, informants, things of this nature, and just hit the streets again trying to find the guy and, and uh, you know, put it out across the country as to what his M.O. is and uh, start looking for similar M.O.s to see if we can pinpoint a location where he might be at. I'll do that. Thank you. Patty Mitchell had been away with a girlfriend the day of the raid. On hearing of his buddy's capture, he shaved his mustache, took his money from a safety deposit box, and hit the road. Patty Mitchell lived on the run for seven long years. He always managed to stay one step ahead of the FBI. He continued to rob banks, always getting in and out in under two minutes. He never once fired his gun. He was good at what he did. He never hurt anybody. Patty never fired a shot in anger. He was a gentleman bandit. He'd also become a master of disguise. He grew beards, dyed his hair, wore wigs, Police never knew who they were looking for. His crime spree elevated him to the FBI's 10 most wanted list. One of his many faces was featured on a television crime show. The FBI needs your help to capture one of the craftiest bank robbers in North America. The show was flooded with tips that led police to the Philippines. That was the first real concrete information that we had had on the whereabouts of Patty Mitchell in probably four years. In the Philippines, the bank robbing playboy had actually settled down. He'd married a local woman and started a family. 
Agents raided Mitchell's home. But once again, he was long gone by the time they arrived. To have had this uh, opportunity and to have let it slip away again uh, after so many years of hard work um, and uh, finding him again um, as far away as the Philippines uh, was something that uh, was not very pleasant to go through. But uh, we had to pick it up again and, and start looking for him again. And we knew that um, he would probably come back to the United States. We just didn't know when or where. Unbeknownst to authorities, Patty Mitchell had quietly slipped into the small town of South Haven, Mississippi on February 21st, 1994. It didn't stay quiet for long. South Haven police. At around 10 a.m., the South Haven police received a disturbing call. A bomb had been placed at City Hall. Unit 311. The call seems suspicious to police chief Tom Long. Okay, bomb threat. That means uh, usually for us uh, some type of diversion. Uh, what is the other end of this? So. Uh, we're talking, okay, let's all watch our financial institutions. But he quickly did the math. South Haven had 13 banks and limited resources. He sent two officers to check out the bomb threat. Yes, sir. Okay, well, hustle out. Hustle out. He ordered the rest of his small staff to cover as many of the banks as they could. Narcotics, homicide, and patrol officers all hit the street. On their way to cover the Deposit Guarantee National Bank, officers got a call that a robbery was in progress. Chief Long's hunch was right. His men were already in the vicinity. the bank in less than 90 seconds. Over the years, the leader of the infamous stopwatch gang had stolen millions of dollars in cities all over the world. But his adventure would end on the hot pavement of a small town in Mississippi. One of the agents, uh, FBI agents, stepped in my office and uh, and was just beaming, you know, said, this is Patrick Mitchell. We have been looking for this guy for 10 years. He's been on the most wanted list. For Patty Mitchell, the clock had finally run out. I think Mitchell played on, number one, the 90-second response, and that is, if you can get in and out in 90 seconds and have you some good avenues of exit, uh, then the odds are you'll probably be successful a few times. But you're only delaying the inevitable. You are going to get caught sooner or later. In 1994, Patrick Michael Mitchell was found guilty of bank robbery and possession of a handgun. He was sentenced to 30 years in a federal prison. He also owed Canada another 18 years for the gold bullion heist back in 1974. Stopwatch accomplice Lionel Wright served his time and was paroled. Stephen Reed also served his time and was paroled. He was sentenced to 18 years for another robbery in Canada in 1999. During the course of his career, Patty Mitchell spent less than 90 minutes robbing millions from banks. For those 90 minutes, he will spend the next 50 years of his life behind bars. He is scheduled to be released in the year 2043 at the age of 99.